Friday. TGIF Friday, Friday, Friday. Hey, my friends, if you're listening on Friday, then hopefully that's an idea. A day that excites you, that gets you looking forward to the weekend. Right now, my plan is to go zip lining with my childhood best friend, Alex. Grew up together. And he lives up in Saratoga. We're going to meet halfway in the middle at Hunter Mountain and go zip lining. That's the plan. Who knows if it'll happen? I'm taping this late on Thursday night. And I just got shot number two of the Moderna juice earlier this afternoon. So I may have a rough, a rough day tomorrow. Although I have chosen, like my parents, to not get the side effects. I've decided I'm not getting them. And my arm hurts, but it hurt the first shot, too. But I'm very glad and giddy that I've got shot number two. Hopefully, I don't have the side effects and tomorrow's not too bad. But don't worry. I'll let you know on social media if you're not following on at Pete Dominic on Twitter. Then do that now if you care. And check in with me, please, folks. I'm very needy. Thank you very much for joining me for today's uh, podcast. It's episode 342 of Stand Up with Pete Dominic Daily. Joining me on the program today... Comedian Christian Finnegan and finance expert Barry Ritholtz, two of your all-time favorites, joining me today. And guess what? No news. No last 24. No news dump. Not today. Fridays, sometimes it's a little harder because I stay up late Thursday nights with my hangout. For those of you that are supporting the show that I could not do it without, the subscribers of this program, about 50 of you hanging out last night. We had a great conversation recorded it and really should share those at least with subscribers because it's always fun we had a lot of laughs we had a little argument about about guns and some politics stuff but not ugly or not uncomfortable at all it's always fun as always a lot of love and i enjoyed it and stayed up late so no time to get the news out to you in a decent way i like to do it i put a lot into that and there was a lot that happened today and analyzing uh, joe biden's speech last night and the uh the uh investigation into Rudy Giuliani and now news that Matt Gates is in deeper trouble. Uh, his buddy flipped on him and said that they had sex with a 17 year old at one point. So a lot to get to with that. And you have the NFL draft going on, which seems to dominate social media. I don't care about that at all, but there is a lot happening and I'm just not going to get to it. Just not going to make it. Just not going to be able to do the news. I'm so sorry, but I like to do a good job at it. And there just wasn't time tonight. So I'm going to, Share with you of both of my conversations here on the Friday program. That's what it'll be. And I'm very happy about both these guys, these conversations, as always. Great to talk with them. Coming up, Barry Ritholtz. I talked about his latest writing. We talked about Michael Lewis's new book. And as always, kind of uh, analyzing uh, behavior and finance and uh, so much more. But right now, I want to share with you first the Finnegan Fridays, everybody. Christian Finnegan, stand-up comedian on Twitter, at Christ Finnegan. He has had an amazing career headlining uh, all over the country now. He just got done with a gig at the Washington, D.C. Improv. And if you get the opportunity to see Christian live, definitely take that opportunity. He told me that there were some stand-up listeners there, which is really cool. And, of course, buy all of his comedy online to support him. Here now is my Friday conversation. It's Finnegan Fridays. Let's go. Christian Finnegan. Yeah. You interviewed me about my second shot. You got yours weeks ago. Oh, yeah. I remember. It's, it's adorable that you're just getting yours now. <laughs> Very, it's cute. Well, cute. You, what was the, uh, the aftermath for you? I'm already on my fifth shot. I don't know. <laughs> so... I don't. Think, I just keep doubling up. Why not, man? Why not? <laughs> I think there's a lot of reasons why not. I just happen to like getting the chills and body aches. Oh, That's just a thing that you know. Did you get it all? Uh, I mean, not really. I mean, you will feel it either tonight or tomorrow. A little bit. No, I chose all not right, to. Maybe you won't. I chose to not get them. Well, oh man, I wish I'd made that decision. Opt- so silly of me. Oh, they didn't ask you if you want to opt out. Yeah, I, I didn't check the box. That thing. I didn't actually check off all the squares that had uh, traffic lights in them, and so therefore, like you know, those captchas where you're signing, yep. you know, and they yep. have the different squares. Yep. I missed one with the traffic lights, so that meant I had body ache and chills. There's a uh, an email that I, that I didn't subscribe to that I cannot unsubscribe to from Kraft Foods. And it has one of those cap to, to unsubscribe. Mm-hmm. You should not have to do anything. You should Abs- just... It's maddening. It's and maddening. this one has the capture things that you just described. Yeah. And once you go and do that, whether it be on a phone or any browser, because I've been trying for six months, it just says it won't work. And yeah. I want to write a letter 
I'm I'm outraged. And who is this for? Craft Foods. I mean, I didn't even I didn't sign up for their. <laughs> Why are you on the Craft Foods? I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, don't you get emails that you're like, I didn't oh, sign. One hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I get the second shot, and then you got to do the fifteen minute thing. <laughs> And I, I, yeah. I sat down and waited for 15 minutes. And the woman that worked there started doing straight up stand up. She was just doing bits that she would do every 15 minutes. You're just recycling jokes. And like which, to the whole group of yep, people waiting. She had yeah. great intentions. She seemed kind. Um, and I was uh, real annoyed by it. Yeah. Because well, she had a because she had better material than you. Well, because I was like, who books this? <laughs> What's it pay? Are there drink tickets involved? This is, this is a group of people that are all having a similar experience. I know exactly how to make them laugh. <laughs> they pay you in dirty syringes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the video of the Orange County supervisor asking the doctor who actually gave him the vaccine? I found out a couple weeks prior to this, asking him if he had heard anything about them uh, uh, having tracking devices inside the vaccines. I missed miss this. Oh. So like in a hearing, like in that kind of deal? Yep. Yep. He's like, have you heard anything about any of the vaccines having tracking devices? And of course, the response that everybody makes when someone makes that insinuation is you're being tracked all the time by everything. Let's yeah, stop. You're tracking yourself. You know, we we spend so long talking about like George Orwell and, and, and all this stuff. And it's like, meanwhile, we offer ourselves up like lambs to the slaughter. You know, uh, you know, I mean. If if you needed any, I'm not even talking about the sort of algorithmic stuff. Uh, you know, people just do it willingly. You know, you look at the insurrectionists; how many of them were incriminated by their own clout chasing? <laughs> I love the people who keep getting turned in from January 6th for the most bizarre reasons by people that they know, including somebody on Tinder. Did you see that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Of course. <laughs> Guy admitted on Tinder As that Bumble. I believe it was Bumble. Oh, forgive me. I'm mistaken. Yes. And uh, and the person, the woman just <laughs> turned him in. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, you've got to really. But that that lets you know. And we may have discussed this in the past, but that lets you know just how secure in their untouchability these people felt. Yes. That it's just like, not only am I going to do this. I'm going to throw it out there, you know, and broadcast it to the world because either one, I am so deluded that I'm so in my own little bubble that I don't understand that other people <laughs> disagree with this. Or two, I think just by virtue of my, you know, race or whatever, that I am completely untouchable and therefore no one can do anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's exactly I think that's exactly what the people are. They're not used to get people aren't used to getting in trouble. Yeah. I mean, wh yeah. white guys are used to often, you know, getting away with with a lot more, not having these concerns. And if you, if you have no ability to empathize with others, then I guess you get outraged when you get caught for doing things that everybody else has been getting caught for. You know, and, and it kind of goes harkens back to my sort of overall diagnosis of what is going wrong with the culture and I'm American, probably world culture, but specifically America, because that's where we live. Um the desire for personal branding to me is the undergirding issue with so much, like so much of what we complain about cancel culture and trolling and sort of performative uh, conservative nonsense, you know, so much of it comes back to the idea of like, I am constructing this idea of who I want people on social media to think I am. That is now overridden who people think I am in real life. Like I'm way more concerned with what people on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, think of me than with what my coworkers think of me, with what my cousins, my family that have disowned me because I'm insane. But so much, you know, and, and again, I feel like a broken record talking about this, but so much of what is wrong right now is people constantly feeling the need to double down and to underline uh, idiotic positions they've taken because to cut against it would go against their brand. I mean, and to me, you see so much, and this of course came into my mind this week because this, this Joe Rogan vaccine thing, that's, uh, you know, that the clip that's making the rounds of him yeah. and Dave Smith talking yeah. about how, 
you know, and, and I, I really, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I really believe that there really is no principle in it whatsoever other than these guys want to get to the other side of this virus and be able to say i didn't get the vaccine you did your sheep i didn't and i don't really think there's any more principle that because i think they're so concerned with preserving that identity as i'm the guy who didn't go along with it but they're counting on the fact that we all will get the vaccine so that they won't actually be in any danger they're just hoping that you know it's it's like the 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 kid who doesn't participate in the group project but still gets to sort of tag along and get the grade because well, everybody else sort of d- did the work for him. Yeah, that's no, really, really well said. But there's just this: how do you how do you differentiate between being a nonconformist, being a contrarian, being someone who doesn't fall in the line, which can often be a great thing and an attribute. Uh, someone that isn't, you know, uh, following the group or following groupthink versus being on the righteous team in this case, like. I have no problem with someone not doing something, being original, being a contrarian at, at, at times and because of their convictions, maybe. But the idea that you wouldn't get vaccinated because of those types of qualities or characteristics doesn't fit. And that's not respectable because it's. I can't finish that point. I was hoping that you would, I was hoping you would interrupt. <laughs> no, I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. But I mean, <laughs> because you're I a guy who respects originality, you are an original of guy, you're an original I do, thinker. But I don't find it contrarian at all. It to me, it's it's the laziest, hackiest version of being contrarian in the world because you're really not being contrarian. You're just adopting the uh, the one B opinion it's like there's the one a opinion and there's one b opinion it's like you're re- so it's like okay so instead of going along with you know 55 n- f- percent of the people you're going to go along with 45 percent of the people how brave of you you know i i, I don't there's nothing ar- to me i have way more respect for somebody who's like yeah i think it's bullshit that we all have to get vaccinated but i'm going to do it anyway because i understand what's on the other side of this and logic dictates if you just look you know the, the the problem i had with that sort of mindset for people who didn't see it it's you know joe rogan and this comic dave smith and i don't know i put comic in quotation marks but uh <laughs> and i don't even mean that as a snarky thing like i genuinely don't think of him as a comic anymore he's a he's considers himself a public intellectual the most intellectual eighth grader you'll ever meet but uh <laughs> If um, you're so right, uh, the guy is. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It, it, I no, just, no, I want to back you up. Make sure I'm before. backing up. This guy uh, uh, puts himself uh, on a pedestal of thinking, which really, really impressive, the deep thinking people don't even deserve. No, no, and and he's the kind of guy who will just you know talk into a microphone and people aren't laughing, and it's because they don't get it in his mind. They don't get it. People don't get it. Okay, sure, whatever. Uh, anyway, um. The, they're saying, uh, base. I, I don't remember my my original they're, point. They're basically, they're they're talking about that. Why get the shot if you're young and healthy? Oh yeah, if you're young and healthy, and I'm not going to put it in my kids, or whatever. It's like everybody knows at this point. And if you don't know yet, do thirty seconds of googling. The reason why people they get vaccinated because even though your kids might not get deathly ill, they will be a lily pad for that frog to jump onto to jump onto something else. So, you know what I mean? Like you will be. You and your children will be vessels for the for the virus to keep circulating. And the longer it circulates, the more it will mutate and then become more and more dangerous. Um, this, it, it, this is not unsettled science. This is the way viruses work. You know, and the, you know how I know this? Because actual virologists have said so. <laughs> People actually went to college, not just sort of my my knee jerk skepticism of the government, man. Like this is the way viruses operate if you let them fester for long enough you don't cut off the sort of food supply meaning healthy bodies for it to invade it will just continue to team around and mutate and then you'll end up with a worse virus that then the, maybe the vaccines won't be uh, able to protect against I, I i think that the mask and vaccination kind of debate there is no debate but this this idea that i don't want to wear a mask and yeah, i don't think it works and i don't want to get a vaccine does more to illustrate the ideologies in, in American culture and other cu- cultures, other countries as well, in terms of it's about me and I don't care about you, and especially if I don't know you. 
Like that's always been part of our DNA, but nothing seems to symbolize that more than these issues surrounding masks and debates yeah. being it's not for you. It's for so many other people and forget the elderly, forget people who are obese or, or whatever, have other uh, you know, comorbidities. What about young kids? Like my friend Wajahad Ali, who's got, you know, his daughter survived cancer and has immune uh, immunodepressant. You know, I'm like, what about kids? I mean, what about the kids? You don't understand, Pete. I have to be able to look my followers in the eye and tell them that I was the cool kid who stood up against the the rising tide yeah. of liberal out overage, blah, blah, blah. But you're not, like that, yeah, that but, is more important than actually preventing needless death. It's more important. Oh, it's more the, important for the world to see me as an iconoclast than it is to, you know, to get rid of this disease in any sort of short term. Imagine having that be your ambition to be an iconoclast. Yeah, to just not even to not even necessarily wait and see what the icon is before you classed it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's the uh, the proper ver- feel, verbiage. But, only- uh, you know, like. There, there's nothing to me inherently admirable about just being contrary to be contrary. I mean, I do think, as we've discussed, comedians are con- contrarian by nature. You know, I think George Carlin said that, uh, you know, the the comedian is the guy who, when the consensus forming is standing off to the side saying, hey, wait a minute or so- something like that. And I, I, I understand that. Yeah, there's but, a lot of issues and, and situations where that's admirable. But it's such a uh, tail wagging the dog situation. It's like among certain people, it's like, oh, I'm just going to be against what the consensus is, regardless of what the consensus is, you know, and but they only apply it to situations which don't pose any in their minds personal risk to themselves. It's like they would never uh, get cancer screening. Oh, it turns out you're it turns out you uh, you have stage two cancer. You have tumors growing in your lungs. They'd never be like, man, like I'm not. You know, I'm not into that. Like, I'm an iconoclast. I don't listen yeah. to these oncologists, man. <laughs> you know, it's it's only in these sort of, in their minds, low stakes environment where it's just completely performative. You yeah, know, I feel like somebody- all the talk about virtue signaling on the left is like the right is just as bad. It is completely a subject of social media that we are all uh, a victim to. You know, the, this this concept of having to broadcast and advertise the type of person that I want you to believe that I am. Yeah. Have I ever to told you what... about my black roommates in college? No, but um, I'm very impressed that you had black roommates in college, Pete. Two. What a, what, wow. Very. Wow. What By a, choice. What a, man, I wasn't just culture. placed with them. <laughs> well, one of them made me be his roommate. Um, so I, I think that's a really good point about the right virtue signaling and, and constantly pointing to that. Are there, are there examples that you can cite off the top of your head where you see that kind of thing happen a lot on, on the right? Because well, I, mean, I just did me, the kind to of... To me, the whole, the whole experience of, of COVID has been an exercise in virtue signaling uh on the right you know and on the left too i mean you'll see sometimes you know uh, and it, nobody is immune to it like i said this is a, a problem that's infected all of us i mean you'll see people now earlier this week biden uh you know they announced that you're allowed to go maskless yep. outside yep. and in small groups outside and you'll you you see a certain section of people being like, nope, still wearing the mask, you know, and, and it's like, OK, fine. It, it doesn't affect me. If you decide you're going to continue to wear your mask outside, if you're vaccinated and you still want to wear masks outside, it does not affect me. Have have at it. But don't pretend that there's any kind of higher, you know, I, I you know, if people want to say like, oh, then I won't get a cold and the flu. OK, sure. Fine, fine. I don't care if you wear a mask. I don't care. It doesn't matter. It doesn't for the rest of your me. life. But just don't, don't, you know, some, somebody I think in either Slate or uh, The Atlantic or some, one of, uh, some, some uh, magazine website, uh, somebody wrote like a long editorial. I was like, I'll still be wearing my mask outside. Thank you. Or something that's like, congratulations. Congratulations. Good for you. Yeah, you know, that, yeah. that's the kind of thing. It's, it's this, that's, but to me, those things are equivalent with the person parading through Target without a mask. Those are equal to me. They're equally silly, except that one is dangerous and one is just silly. Right. That that's the difference. One yeah. is extremely dangerous, or it could at least you know affects people. Like it doesn't affect. If you want to wear a mask, if you're a hypochondriac, let's forget masks, and and you do all kinds of things uh, to 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 prevent yourself from getting sick. Well, do whatever you want. That's fine. But yes. if you don't do a thing that could get other people sick, 
that creates a lot of anxiety for people. The likelihood of you getting someone sick because you don't wear a mask in Target is extremely low. But you are going to affect people a lot in a negative way by just making them concerned. So why do that? Why not just, quote, fall well, into place? Because these are people who, who f- have either by their own personal nature or because they've just spend too much time online and have wrapped themselves into a frenzy. These are people who get an almost erotic charge by yes. making people get upset. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? The, the, the idea that you're going to be nervous or anxious around me, it gets me hard. Essentially. It's the guy who wears the eight guns to go to Panera bread. It's like, Everyone's uncomfortable around me, and I feed off of that energy. I'm really someone. trying to think if I would ever do that, and if I did, it, and how I would do it, and how it would make me feel good. And I did. Someone sent me a T-shirt that says uh, from Raygun in Iowa. Uh, hey Kim, she sent it to me. Um, it says, uh, "Sorry about Donald Trump." And I was like, you know what? I don't know that I need to wear that shirt out in public because I just I don't know that I need to fire people up. But I do like it when people do do that. My my friend Jason, who's a big fan of yours, does that kind of thing. But he's he's a big dude, so go ahead and fight Mm -hmm. him. But I mean, like, I can't think of anything that I would do that would in public purposely trigger someone or make them make them feel uncomfortable, and then that would make me feel good. It seems like a quality that we should all, as a community of human beings, share. I feel like it is a junk food emotion (laughs) what do you mean (laughs) like that it feels good but is not ultimately nourishing right (laughs) you know what i mean uh and we're all listen i sometimes you just want a big mac there's nothing wrong with that bag of chips i try to not troll people online just because again it's like it's a a weird angry joy that you get from it and i don't think that there is um i don't think it makes you happy at the end of the, at the end of the day, it might feel good in the moment, but I, I don't think it's ultimately nourishing for your soul to sort of just, you know, uh, dunk on people at every given opportunity, yeah. uh, either in person or online. But, you know, I don't think it is uh, certain circumstances in certain situations. Sure. Like, you know, when the, um, uh, Fred, uh, what's the, the, uh, the Westboro Baptist church Phelps, uh, yeah, Phelps, uh, when they would be protesting outside, you know, a soldier's funeral or, you know, a gay pride parade, yeah. you know, to have two gay people start making out in front of them, you know, and, and or wear some shirts that are destined to piss them off. Like, OK, well, that I can support because they started it. You know what I mean? It's like you brought your bullshit out into public. So I'm going to counter that with some, you know, other bullshit. But I don't feel like I don't know. It's a thin line because to some people, some people would consider a Black Lives Matter T-shirt to be the equivalent of one of those trolling type t-shirts. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yep, like yep. So everybody has their own, uh, their own definition of what stops when, when it becomes sort of needlessly provocative or intentionally provocative, you know, whereas I would not consider black lives matter sure to be in that same, uh, category as sorry about Donald Trump. Um, those are different to me. One is sort of a gag. Fuck you. <laughs> I'm looking to piss you off t-shirt. And the other is an actual statement of, you know, a a cultural a a cause i'm not making any sense no that makes that no i think you're talking about the the kind of gradations and the and the small differences here in behavior and people's reactions i think that's important i think that's uh what people are here for so let me ask you well let me tell you the thing speaking of uh being pissed off the thing that pissed me off the most this week was rick santorum did you hear about his comments? Oh, about yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. really, I know I knew Rick Santorum. I worked with him directly at CNN, and I was very helpful in trying to help his 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 crazy wife figure out how to be on TV. And and he was very kind to me at that time, and um and very nice guy, whatever. But, th- like, that has nothing to do and no bearing on, on a big corporate news, whatever you want to call it, CNN, Keeping him on the payroll, I mean, time after time after time, he said such ignorant, uninformed, deeply offensive and racist things. But I don't know, you know, Native Americans, tribal folks in this country get so little attention and so much marginalization. And and, and the idea that you would say something so stupid and so ignorant that Native Americans, really, their contributions are, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but but minimal. 
like I, I absolutely am pissed that he is still there. And I just tweeted something about that because it just made me so mad when CNN didn't renew my friend Wajahat Ali's contract because I thought he was so good and out front on issues regarding white supremacy for years and years and years. I was so psyched when they hired him to have his voice, a brown mm-hmm. guy, a Muslim guy who's so articulate and funny. And, and they didn't renew his contract. And yet year after year, Rick Santorum, who there's a dime of dozen of keeps getting renewed and after this i just felt like you know i I hate to call for someone's firing it's not my style at all but dude's gotta go uh, not just on that comment but on the whole litany of them time time for him to go and we'll see if the uh the the brian stelters and the other media people uh take this issue on but i fear they'll ignore it what is it too much to to call for someone's firing much less his I don't know. It's, it's a hard, it's a, it's a hard landscape to have these conversations now because they become so muddled in with quote unquote cancel culture and crap like that. It's, you know, that, you know, you know, the position that people will take, uh, you know, if, if, if people like you say, Oh, uh, Rick Santorum should not be, you know, paid by CNN. It's like, oh, they're trying to cancel Rick Santorum. Yes. And, and he'll get lumped in with Shane Gillis, like as if those are like right. equal, you know, equal people uh, or, you know, equal circumstances. Um, when obviously <laughs> Shane Gillis is a comedian who made goofy jokes on the podcast. And, and to Rick be clear, Santorum never got hired. Consultants. Yeah. Uh-huh. And he never yeah, got hired. Exactly, like yeah. SNL didn't hire him as a result of that controversy. But my point is, in this case, the difference is Rick Santorum's been at CNN for over 10 years. Of, of and he course, has but I'm long... just saying, though, that it will then it will get dragged into that same yeah. extremely boring cultural conversation that you can almost repeat yep. by memory at this point. Um, you know, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit. Uh, we were talking last week about my sort of dumb theory about internal morality and external morality. And again, I've got to think of better terms for that. I'm Rick Santorum from what I can tell. And based on what you've told me and other people have said is very polite and is very convivial and, uh, is a a nice person. Mm -hmm. Niceness is not necessarily a compliment. It is a, it's an adjective to describe someone's way of being. It's not the same as kindness, obviously. Uh, it's not the same as morality being nice being nice just means you're nice. It just means you're polite. Um, and people respond well to that. And I think because he nominally would push back on Trump every once in a while. Um, like I do think that his religious convictions as fucked up as they are, uh, are somewhat sincere and that Trump's obvious non-religiosity rubbed against Santorum. And that would occasionally cause him to push back against Trump and then quickly fall back into line when their interests aligned again. But, um, you know, I, I think that if, if Rick Santorum had told one of the people in the office to fuck off or something like that, he would get fired a lot quicker than if he, completely espoused a white supremacist viewpoint that That is historically inaccurate in addition to being morally disgusting uh do you think yeah do you think jimmy kimmel did uh was wrong to have the my pillow guy on his show uh i did not i i didn't watch it i i didn't i was only aware of it via twitter and i don't know i have mixed feelings about that i feel like the he's such a buffoon I mean, it's weird to think that he was as close to power as he was. Not necessarily close to having it, but that, that he had access to actual Influence. legitimate power. Yeah. That's bizarre and terrifying, obviously. Um, I certainly felt like it would be ridiculous and absurd and indefensible before Biden took office. Now, I, listen, yeah, it's, pro- it's, it's not cool. If I if I worked on Jimmy Kimmel and they told, oh, by the way, Mike Lindell's going to be on the show next week, I would probably I would like to think I would quit or. Uh, but as far as an audience member, as just somebody yeah. in social media reading about it, I don't know, there's there's things I care more about. I do think there's the only thing I'd say is I think there's a difference between a show that is almost entirely primarily for entertainment versus, you know, news shows like quote news having somebody on and platforming them, much less, you know, a college bringing a speaker that wasn't just for entertainment. I, I think there's a difference in terms of sometimes the arena, but I, I thought it was a terrible idea. 
uh, for Jimmy Kimmel to have him on and give him a platform. It's a about stupid idea. Nonsense. It's ridiculous, yeah. but it's, it's just kind of, of in, in the hierarchy of things I can be mad about. It's, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, did you watch, uh, did you stay up late and watch Joe Biden? I was busy watching my New York Knickerbockers, ah. uh, so I was not able to watch the speech in real time, but I've seen uh, a number of clips and some recaps. I read Greg Sargent's recap in the Washington Post and stuff He's like that. That's always great. Did you? So I didn't watch it. Did and the, one of the things that I feel is lovely about it is that I don't feel like I had to watch it. I know what, what Biden's positions are. I know I know what the government is doing, and I know that they're working in concert with each other. And so, although last night I'm sure was was nice and important, and and all those things, I already know what they're trying to do, and I support it. And so I don't need to watch the speech as much. It just doesn't feel, you know, it's not like he's going to radically, you know, undo what his administration is trying to accomplish the way Trump, like who knew what weird shit would come out of his mouth and they would have to scramble and try to justify it afterwards. Well, the reason I wanted, I was hoping that you did watch it, not that you need to, to give me an answer on this, was that normally there are 1600 people at those speeches. And last night there were 200 and we know what it's like to perform in front of a large room with not that many people on it. Granted, when we're doing it, it's not being a live streamed across the world for everybody to see. So you don't necessarily have that in, in your mind's eye. But it's hard. It's weird. It's, and it was very weird yeah. to see him in that space. But I don't think I don't think you missed a beat. I thought he did a did a great job. But that is I mean, I think we've had about a year to get used to. I mean, I say we being people who speak in front of people for a living. Yep. Uh, we're we're all a bit used to watching people do it. And I think people who do it for a living are a little used to doing it at this point. And it's obviously a lot easier when you're reading a written speech off of a teleprompter. You know, it's not like your material is going to change because the room didn't fill (laughs) like, Oh boy. Uh, Hey guys, uh, we didn't sell as many tickets as we thought we're going to have to uh, rewrite the healthcare plan. (laughs) Like it's not, it's not like the speech changes according to how many people have shown up. I was really hoping Um, he would say we could have done this in my apartment in my Honda civic, like every single (laughs) comedian ever does with a small group of people. Why do do we need this big space? We could have done this anywhere. So My, my, uh, yeah, I, I might go to small audience lines, which I, we all have. I heard that you turned off the Knicks to watch Tim Scott's rebuttal. Is that true? Oh, of course. I mean, it's it's <laughs> only because I had uh, I had put money on it on FanDuel. What do you think of the uh, the, the the party? I don't of, even know that. The party <laughs> the party of white supremacy throwing out one of three black Republicans they have. You know, I, I don't want to fall into the trap of diminishing. Tim Scott as an elected senator. Uh, oh, to that's just why I had you on. Well, <laughs> like, I don't want to just immediately scream tokenism, although certainly it occurs to you <laughs> that that is at play. Um, you know, there's there's a reason why they didn't that Paul Gosar didn't do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're, they're obviously trying to put forward a face that does not ma- match any actual Republican or Republican Party official that mm. I've seen over the last three years. Uh, this they're trying to sort of rekindle this idea of this, you know, sympathetic, compassionate conservative thing that, you know, they might as well be the Whig Party at this point. You know, it's nobody recognizes that. Republican Party. It doesn't exist anymore. Right. But, you know, good for them for for trying, I guess. Uh, I read an interesting uh, op-ed today by uh, Leanna Wen, uh, who is, uh, a, I, can't, I think she's an immunologist or a virologist, yep. um, basically talking about how last night was kind of a mixed opportunity by having everyone so masked and having it be so uh, socially distanced that it felt almost like it was like six months ago and people are kind of they They want to feel signs of optimism and hope. Here's, um, here's the tweets around that. The Washington Post, Dr. Leanna Wen writes, already a very damaging narrative is taking hold. If the vaccines are so effective, why so many precautions for the fully vaccinated? What's the point of getting inoculated if not much changes? Imagine if last night's joint session, President Biden allowed only vaccinated individuals. They could take off their masks, hug and sit together just like. 2019, that would be the strongest message that vaccines equal return to pandemic normal. How'd I do in just grabbing that? Is that the points yeah, that well, you're talking I mean, about? Certainly described it better than I did. Well, those are the points version. that you're talking about that, that you thought yeah. that. Yeah. 
That's interesting. Yeah. I never it, even considered I, that. I don't know where I fall on it, but it, I thought it was interesting. And I, I mean, I, I know that when I was talking before about those people who were kind of like, I'm going to continue wearing my mask no matter what. It's like, okay, fine, go ahead. But I would, I would put a little birdie in people's heads that if you are vaccinated, that it is kind of important to celebrate that for your own sake, mm-hmm. first of all, so that you feel like things are getting better in, in, in ways that are safe that have been, you know, uh, sort of uh, advanced by medical science, you know, scientists, CDC, et cetera. But also to kind of show the kind of ease our toe back into the water. It's like kind of like when, uh, you know, the woman who got her arm uh, bitten off by a shark, the surfer, mm-hmm. you know, it's like yep. at a certain point, she's got to start surfing again. And I'm sure it wasn't zero to 60. I'm sure there was like, I'm just going to dip my toe in the water. And then it's just like, I'm just going to sit on my surfboard five feet from shore. You know, I'm sure it wasn't immediate. You're running out there and, and, you know, full on surfing in the middle of the ocean again. But I would say that there's something to be said uh, for kind of dipping our toe back into the water again and kind of getting back into semi normal life as a way to kind of trick our own brains or to fix our own brains to tell ourselves that things are going to get better, but also to kind of just to show the world. And again, like like uh, that that article was saying, it's like this is what is possible if we're vaccinated. This is what's better. We're not just we're not just going to like cower and play chicken little for the rest of our lives. M- you know, vaccines and masks are a means to an end, and that end is being able to fucking be packed together at a sweaty yep. concert again. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, I think there's just so much to be said. We never talk about it, or we don't talk about it enough. But just role modeling behavior that you'd like to see it influences people. Uh, without them even knowing it. I mean, I know that as a parent so intimately, uh, but, uh, but, but in terms of Joe Biden taking his mask off the other day outside or what she's, uh, what this doctor's writing about, what, what might be if you see people enjoying themselves, you might say, hey, I want, I want to enjoy myself too. I need to do what? Okay, I'll do that. And, and, and to kind of to, to cut against the culture war aspect of this is that there are certain people, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but there are certain people I feel like who are going to hold on to the mask wearing, maybe because they are genuinely still concerned, but also is kind of like a, like a, again, a virtue signal th- that it's like, I'm one of the maskers. I'm not one of the anti maskers. Mm-hmm. Like, this is my identity. I'm the person who is pro mask and that that then becomes an identity. And again, at the end of the day, if you continue wearing mask, it doesn't affect me. I don't really give a shit. I think it's a little silly, but I, I think that it is important you know, all of the, all of us who have been saying it, follow the science, follow the science, follow the science. I think it's important that we actually do follow the science, even when the science is telling us, Hey, it's time to get back to normal. Yeah. Yeah, you know? absolutely. To prove, to prove the point we've been trying to make for the last year, yep. which is that we're not just wearing masks to show our morality. It's like, no, this is a means to an end. And the end is being able to get back to our fucking yeah, lives. It's such a weird thing, though, that anybody would ever say, you know, insinuate that somebody likes wearing a mask. It's like, I hate wearing a mask. It's annoying. I hate I mean, I, some. You know, what? I disagree. I do think there are some people there is what what they call secondary gain, ugly, which is, you ugly know, people. Uh, Huh? Ugly people. Who like wearing masks. <laughs> no, I've heard a lot of women say that they kind of uh, appreciate the anonymity of being able to wear a mask. Like they don't get the hey smile type shit. Anymore. I've not heard anybody talk about that. That's interesting. I, I've heard a few women talk about it and that they can kind of just they don't. There's none of that crap right now. You know, um, that's why that there's a, a, an anonymity to it, which is similar to why a lot of women wear headphones at the gym. Right. Exactly. Don't, no need to talk to me. Basically, yeah, it's like, you know, uh, you know, women to truly be safe from creeps, they just have to encase their entire body. And then then we and then we hit into burka territory. Yeah, <laughs> there's a, the, a point where you're through the looking glass there. Before I let you go, you uh, had your first headlining shows last weekend at the at the legendary DC Improv. And I just want to know how it went. We talked about it before you went. You were pumped to do it. Uh, uh, nervous to be back up there for an hour just because of you know material not 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 working it out the way that we normally do. How'd it go? How'd it feel? It's good, rusty. It's certainly, and I knew this would be the case. I had uh, two shows Thursday, two shows Friday, two shows Saturday. By Saturday, I felt like I was back in the pocket. You know, like this yeah. is now. I remember, Thir- you know, and it was all the shows were fun. Some of them more than others. Um, I would not say that I was operating at my peak, which is understandable. Um, 
some of the material I'm still kind of working out or whatever. The biggest problem also is that um, because of uh, capacity limits in, in DC, the closest table can only be 20 feet from the stage. Can't be any closer than 20 feet, which Ooh, is dear. insanely no. far. Like uh, I couldn't moat, see anybody. Call that the moat. You don't want yeah, a moat. There was no, I could not see anyone's actual uh, oh, that's brutal. facial I don't features. Like that at all. And so, you know, and when you have 50 people spaced out in a room that seats 300, it's, it's, um, you know, you're not going to get that momentum, that cathartic right. sort of rolling laughter yeah, where it's sort yeah, of, yeah. It, it, cause sometimes it's infectious, you know, you're all packed yeah, together always. and you're laughing, just make me laugh, which is making you laugh. And, and so, uh, it was a ton of fun and it was great, but I would, I would say it just made me more excited for things being back to normal. Again. Is there any way to describe what the audience's feeling was like to be out? For them, did you talk to folks after the show? Like to be out for them and to be out with other people and to be laughing. There's something amazing about being at a comedy club and enjoying comedy with complete strangers. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of people said that after the show, like this is our first night out, and thank you so much, mm -hmm. and you know we're we're so happy to be out again, and 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 all that, and that's that's wonderful. But it is not the same as being actually completely wrapped up in a comedian set. Right. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah. I don't really want the audience to be feeling a sense of relief and tears of joy. I want them to be, I want them to be invested in what I'm talking about, you know? Um, but it's part of the process and I'm thrilled that people came out and uh, it was a, you know, a mega ton of fun. Any uh, other dates that we should plug right now? Uh, not really a, a few dates i'm doing a one-nighter in connecticut next week but it's not worth mentioning oh, um, <laughs> you just mentioned it. Well, that's probably not great I, I, i'm hoping there did no one heard me say that <laughs> i recorded it i'm recording <laughs> i pressed record earlier um <laughs> no, uh, and we'll talk about this in the future, but as you know, I'm kind of going back on the shelf for a little while. I have to have a bit, a little bit of a medical procedure in the oh, next right, couple of weeks. Right, right, right. And uh, that means I won't be able to perform for a while. But, uh, doesn't that sound cryptic? Huh? Well, whenever you want to talk about that publicly, I'm happy. And I think a lot of people would, yeah. uh, it would resonate. We'll tease so. them. We'll tease them. Um, but yeah, maybe next week. Thank you uh, very much. Fine. I'm going to be fine. He's going to be, um, he's totally but yeah, fine, we'll, but it's not necessarily going to be fun. Um, yeah. and, uh, I appreciate love ending my week talking to you. And so Indeed. does so many other people I heard from yet another person yesterday saying I was so disappointed and am disappointed when we don't get to hear from Christian. So no pressure, but we always love when you're joining <laughs> us. No, well, no thank you to that person. But and, uh, that's Addison. I, Give Addison a shout out. He loves if there you. were 10,000 more of you, I'd be rolling in it. They're uh, out there. I'm, we'll find them. I'm very, very grateful. Anyone who gives poop. Thank you very <laughs> so much, sir. You. All right, buddy. I'll talk to you later. Christian Finnegan at Christ Finnegan, everybody. Ain't he great? Go give him a follow on Twitter and thank him for joining me. Always great to get his perspective on things. And I just love ending my week with him. I hear so many great things. I We get so much good feedback on those conversations. So I don't know what else to tell you other than thank you for enjoying it and letting us know. Very much appreciated. We really should get out on the road and do some dates together. How about that? Get out there and get some gigs, get some jobs. Speaking of jobs, folks, you know, it is hard to hire the right people to work with and work at your company. Do a good job, right? I mean, it's hard to find good people, which is why I'm very excited to tell you about Indeed. Because if you're the hiring expert for your company... What you really need is help making your shortlist of quality candidates, right? I mean, wouldn't that be super helpful if you had a partner? Well, you, you do now. That's right. Indeed.com, a hiring partner who helps you make your life easier. You need Indeed. It's the job site that makes hiring so easy. You can post, screen, and interview all on Indeed. One, two, three. Bang it right out. Get your quality shortlist of candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job description faster and only pay for the candidates that meet must-have qualifications. And schedule and complete video interviews in your Indeed dashboard. Indeed makes connecting with and hiring the right talent fast and easy. And with tools like Indeed's Instant Match, giving you the quality candidates whose resume on Indeed fits your job description immediately, and Indeed skills test that, on average, reduces hiring time by 27%, and you need that time. 
So you can choose from more than 130 skills tests, or you can just add your own. Then you just add the must-have requirements, so you only pay for applicants that meet them. According to Talent Nest, Indeed delivers four times more hires than all other job sites combined. If you are hiring, you need Indeed. Right now, you can join over 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent. Get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash stand up. Get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash stand up. Indeed.com slash stand up. Indeed.com slash stand up. Offer valid through June 30th. Terms and conditions apply. Indeed.com slash stand up. Did you get that? I hope you got that. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, folks, for joining me today because I now have not only Christian Finnegan, one of your all-time favorites, but the great Barry Ritholt. Cut off with him on a Thursday afternoon in his home in Long Island. And Barry is always a great guest talking about economics and finance and investments and markets and media and politics and behavior and so much more. And today, another great conversation with Ritholtz, who you can follow on Twitter at Ritholtz. That's his Twitter handle, RitholtzWealth.com. His blog is The Big Picture, and he is a columnist at Bloomberg News, as well as a podcast host. His podcast is called Masters in Business. It's very good, as is he, every time we talk. Always a pleasure, always fun, always learn a lot. Here is at Ritholtz right now. I wanted to ask you what about this Michael Lewis book that you're touting. You ah, love, you love so Michael Lewis fun. more than anybody loves Michael Lewis. He no, can, that's not true. He, he, uh, you, I you think would let lots him have of, an affair with your wife. You would let lots him, of people love Michael Lewis. He is our poet laureate of finance. Think about the books he's written and how amazing they've been. He wrote Liar's Poker as a cautionary tale to convince people not to go into finance, and it became a how-to guide to get a job in finance. Hmm. So that's how he started his writing career. P.S., he tells the story. He was on a trading desk, and he was terrible. He was an institutional sales trader, and he was moonlighting, writing on the side, and um, eventually got published, and the boss called him in and said, hey, you can't publish this. He's like, oh, okay, I won't do it anymore. So he starts publishing under a nom de plume. Somebody, I forgot who it was, but it was somebody famous as father in publishing says, sees this and goes, this is familiar, figures out who he is, offers him a, a, a professional writing gig. And the next thing you know, here's Liar po- The be- So many of his books have been made into movies. Um, Moneyball is just amazing. The Big Short, The Blind Side. I don't know how they're going to do the un- undoing project. I don't know if that's m- movie ready. But this about the pandemic, it's called The Premonition of Pandemic Story, is fascinating. P.S. He's on 60 Minutes this weekend. I'm his first interview after 60 Minutes. Awesome. And that's out on, I think, Tuesday, the Listen podcast. Listen to Masters in Business, Barry Riddle's yeah. podcast, of course. Now, what is this? And by the way, I think I've interviewed him like five or six times, including... Once at a giant conference with like 3,000 people, and uh, I can't begin to tell you how much fun it was, primarily because I'm at a dinner the night before I interview him, and I've, I've met him before. He's a fascinating character. I enjoy his company, and um, I'm at a dinner with a bunch of, you know, finance and ETF and media people, and I'm, I would have been very happy spending the rest of the night hanging out, eating steak, drinking with them. And my phone lights up and it's him. And he's like, dude, I got to the hotel early. You, I got to get some food and a drink. Where can we go? I'm like, meet me in the monkey bar. So we get a, we sit at the corner of the monkey bar in the, one of these restaurants in the hotel. And for three hours, just sat there. That's great. BSing. And I'm like, you know, I'm glad that we're doing this now. But really, we should have had a recorder going because this is the interview. He goes, no, I wouldn't have said any of these things. Ah. I'm like, oh, now I got to remember what not to ask you tomorrow. And But meanwhile, you know, I was drinking, he was drinking, but he just got off a flight from California. I was had to get up early for work the next day. So I was kind of going slow and he was, uh, let's say he had no obligations till five o'clock. I so, like that uh, feeling. The next day. So, so it was just a blast. And it's funny that someone like him can sit at the end of a bar 
and nobody really recognizes him. Well, one or two people came by towards the end of the night. Hmm. Um, but it was, he, he, I just find the way he tells stories is just really interesting. Well, I mean, the way in that writing, he tells it, like he tells a story about a, a an issue, right? Like he tells a long yarn that is symbolic of what's wrong with you know, payday loan to predatory lending or fi- right. any, any other financing. I, and, and he does it in, in a way that is very personal and unique and, and, and entertaining really. I mean, so, so I asked him a question or I, it wasn't so much a question as a challenged him to disagree with me, but I said, this book is the perfect Michael Lewis archetype. And he's like, what do you mean? I go, so you have a big institution that's faltering or failing and has been for a long time. The insiders can't see it. They can't see the forest for the trees. A very intelligent group of somewhat quirky outsiders um, I identify this institutional failure. They're watching it happen. And to better or less effect, they try and put up the flag and warn people about it. Fortunes are made and lost. People live and die. And... That's he goes, well, to some degree, that's the big short. And he goes to a lesser degree. It's flash boys. And I go, what about Moneyball? And and he says, "Uh, yeah, I guess I go. You have the outsiders coming in. They completely rejiggered baseball. Oh, and P.S. Then basketball, then football, then. So that's that. And then I go, what about undoing project? And he says, oh, no, this Where's the quirky outsiders? I'm like, uh, Tversky and Kahneman, they're psychologists. They completely upended um, finance and uh, and and investing. He goes, well, I guess you're kind of right. Mm-hmm. Now, P.S., when we do our recordings, right, it's 60 to 90 minutes. They have to edit it down to two blocks, 32 minutes for radio. Uh, you need an hour uh, to get an hour of radio. You need 32 minutes, but plus news, traffic, sports, weather, advertising. And then, you know, more or less, we we put most of it online. Uh, we clean up some flubs, some curses, some mistakes. Someone will say, I, you know, I said that wrong or I gave the wrong date. I'm like, do it again. So um, normally, if we like have a footnote digression and me and a guest are discussing or debating something, normally I tell the editor, hey, take out all that cross chatter yeah, yeah, on that yeah. side talk. It must be a nightmare to have to do <laughs> with. I can't even imagine. <laughs> so the the... Audio engineer says to me, dude, I'm leaving all of that shit in. That was awesome. I'm yeah. like, really? Yeah. He's like, no, you don't understand. So, you know, Mike Batnick in my office. Yeah, he's a great guy. Batnick says to me one day, I forgot. Oh, it was after the Ray. <laughs> it was after the Ray Dalio's interview where he says to me, he goes, I figured out your superpower. And, uh. What, the ability to tell people what car they should be driving? That's my superpower. (laughs) And he says, no, your superpower is you talk to everybody you meet the same way. Hmm. You talk to your gardener and to billionaires and to Uber drivers and to Mike Bloomberg. You speak to them exactly the same. And Hmm. that's a superpower. Yeah, that's also a great quality. It's a it's a I I had to think about it. Uh, real, so I know it's because I'm a, a oblivious idiot that I don't know better. Right. Like a hundred years ago, I would have been certainly a thousand years ago. I would have been killed at 14. Like, who is that impudent rascal? I mean, that's what would have happened. But like, you can call the king a schmuck. That's not acceptable. Yeah. But um, even I don't know, even 150 years ago, I would have been killed in a, a Wild West bar fight. But. You know, I, I'm I don't know my station in life, yeah. so I don't feel the obligation to talk up or down to anybody. It's like, hey, you put your pants on one leg at yeah, a time. No, your, your lack of self-awareness is surprisingly attractive. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, I think I have to write a book on how completely oblivious I am to what's going on around the, me. The, what happens uh, here every time I talk to you is you're like, ah. Ah, nobody's gonna like that. And then I get a bunch of emails like I could listen to Ritholtz jabber on for another six hours. I'm like, yeah, he doesn't know. He doesn't know why people like him, but they it's, do. Uh, so, but what is this book? Though? Hold that's on. Funny. The premonition, a pandemic story. What? What is it? What is Michael Lewis's new book about? I still don't know. 
so the the shocking thing about this is one of the there are three main characters. There are lots of characters, but there are three main characters. Um, and then it kind of starts out with George W. Bush after getting his ass kicked in 9-11 and then Katrina on summer after Katrina, someone gives him a book by I think the guy's name is John Barry on the 1918 pandemic. It was the worst pandemic. Gave, prior gave to him this. a book short. What gave someone gave Michael Short a book no, or George Bush gave the book to George W. Bush? Oh, right. Go yeah. I think after nine yeah. eleven, after Katrina, mm-hmm. and Bush, to his credit, reads the book and mm-hmm. comes back to the White House and says. And by the way, the book is full with a little bit of salty language. Says, "What the fuck are we going to do? We're we're going to get steamrolled." He goes, "I got." But he goes, I was barely in office. I was, you know, waylaid by 9-11. Then Katrina, he goes, we can't we can't suffer another blow. So he convenes a pandemic group to put together. By the way, Trump is shockingly not present in this book. Um, Mm. Very, very little. I think there's one mention of Jared Kushner, Mm. maybe four or five references to Trump, if that. And just in passing. And um, so if you read his book, The Fifth Risk, the book describes and I asked him this question and I loved his answer to it. The book describes how the federal government is your emergency threat responder when crises of any type, an existential threat to the to to the country. It could be a run on the banks. It could be a hurricane. It could be a flood. It could be a pandemic. And so underestimating the value and saying we want to make the government small enough to drown in a bathtub and, you know, saying, uh, you know, all the private sector can manage this and just so much stuff that's been disproven over and over and over again. So he left that and he said, he goes, you know, for the first three years of the Trump administration, he goes, I was watching and I was saying, Gee, you know, I, I warned that it's important to have experts and it's important to be prepared and it's important to have a functional government. Pfft, you know, who knows? Maybe I was. Uh, and then the pandemic hits and it's like, oh, so these guys just got dumb lucky for three years. And then when a real challenge arose, they were unable to mm. to meet it. It's interesting. And, just that one point about Bush, though, and, and sorry to bring up Trump, but it is interesting that Bush read a book. That someone gave him and came back and said, hey, hey you know, we got uh, to do, do something. something. But but right. but, you know, and, and, and it's so easy to say that Bush was such a horrible president because he was. But he did have fundamental character qualities and and even qualities. Yes, of intellect that were right. normal. Whereas he's Donald, not a dumb guy. Bush isn't a dumb guy. He's a little goofball and arguably he's a pretty, did, he's a pretty dumb guy. But well, the, arguably he did too much drinking and too much drugs when no, he was I mean, younger. Like, listen, and, you know what the thing about him is, and I'll, I'll go off on this tangent with you. The thing about George W. Bush is why he's not impressive is because mm-hmm. his dad and his grandfather are, are why so he is So impressive. Oh my God. No, so because impressive. He, wouldn't, he didn't have to overcome anything, George Bush. Right. Outside hey, listen, of his, that's, the, that's the challenge. It, it is a mixed blessing to be a child of wealthy people. And I say that as someone who grew up pretty hard scrabble. And, yeah. you know, the value of you haven't seen what we've done to the house. So I bought a house that was a, a wreck and a fixer upper. And, you know, when I drop five thousand dollars on a project in the house, I, I, that's real money or more than that. It's real money. And come on. And Ritholtz has that in his couch cushions. Yeah. But what I'm saying is <laughs> I'm aware of the yeah. fact I'm aware of the fact that, you know, the value of a dollar because of where you grew up. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'm grateful that if I need to I had to put a new roof on this house which was we knew of all the repairs I had to do, the roof was the one that we had on the bottom of the priority list because supposedly they had already done one of the sections. And, you know, it just turned out to be a half ass cheap fix. And, you know, if I used to know my house. I have a contemporary flat roof house to slap a new roof on any contemporary house is 40,000 minimum. And this is three levels, you know, three different flat roofs. So it was even more than that. It's I I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was at least 50 grand. Mm. So out comes the HELOC. You put it on that. You pay it down on a monthly basis. But, yeah, I'm I'm grateful I'm capable of doing that. But there are if you were born into wealth, it's like, yeah, fuck it. 50 grand. Put a new roof on. Who cares? 
Uh, to me, it's like, oh my God, that's an ungodly amount. That's a car and a half. Well, I'm just not. In, I'm just generally. I'm nothing wrong with it. You didn't. It's not your fault that you were born in privilege or wealth or whatever station you are in life. But I'm just not as impressed with the Mitt Romneys and the George W. Bushes as I am, frankly, with the Bill Clintons, Barack right. Obamas, and and John the Joe McCain. Bidens. Right. Yeah. That, no, that John, is, John McCain is is the third in line of, you know, his grandfather was the admiral. His father was the admiral. But they all went to military service. They all didn't but, take the cheap, lazy of, route. Yeah, out. but because John McCain was tortured for seven years, that experience educated him to, to right. be against torture when the rest of his party was right. for it. That's so exactly at least right. he had that horrible experience to draw from. But, but you know, it, it, it's a sad thing that you have to live something like that to be opposed to something like that. You shouldn't have after you should be able to to empathize with people and, and the fact is that you have to harden steel in order for it to right. hold an edge right. and people you know if you it, it's a rare back in the day it was called noblesse oblige if you were born into wealth it came and again i'm going to reiterate i was not but it came with an obligation the noble obligation to serve your community your society uh, Etc. You're to make sure the peasants in your kingdom were fed and safe. I know that sounds absurd, but that's what that means. Well, speaking of uh, wealth and peasantry, let's talk about your your piece that was very popular this week. Both yeah. can read it ridholtz dot com. Uh, it's titled "Making the Top One Percent Its Own Tax Class," and. There is a proposal by uh, Democrats and the the Biden administration about taxing uh, 41 percent capital gains rate on a very on those at that very high tax bracket. Right. But you're quibbling with this for uh, a lot of really good reasons. This is very wonky stuff here. So if you could just break it down to tax rates, this is a hard thing to make sexy. Um. Tax rates. Sexy is the wrong word. Interesting and understandable is the bogey I'm aiming for. Okay. So, so first, look, uh, you have to step back and look at the big picture here. And after World War II, we had a giant boom, and that boom included 41 million GIs returning home. They could. They were tons of jobs waiting for them. If you wanted to go to college, the GI Bill would pay your way so you could get a better job. And for the next, you know, 25, 30, 40 years, the middle class expanded. You could uh, actually have a, uh, a decent income to support a family with uh, one worker. You didn't need both people working. Um, and so you look at everything that took place in the 50s, the 60s. You, you had the build out the rest of the 40s. You had the. You know, all these people coming to work and then the baby boom and then the build out of suburbia and then the rise of automobile culture and to some degree credit and consumerism, but also suburbia, commercial aviation, the electronics industry. And, you know, that kind of faltered in the 70s. We had Vietnam, Malays, Watergate, stagflation, oil embargo, like the late 60s early and then the civil unrest of the late 60s. Not that it wasn't necessary, but all those things were uh, put together. That plus polyester and disco. That's a tough de- decade for any country. And it wasn't until like 19, early 1980s. Um, where it started to improve. 82 really is where things started to pick up again. And the economy began to expand and you you still had a lot of good middle class jobs, but a lot of things began to change in the early 80s. And the sort of uh, concept of a big middle class with everybody participating in paying their share of taxes and building infrastructure and doing all this, that all starts to fall apart, beginning with, you know, the Reagan tax cuts had some positive things in them, but they also started the ball rolling in a a wrong direction. There were a lot of like dumb, kooky tax laws that the Reagan tax cuts got rid of. But uh, and then some of the top rates came down and then. You know, the classic story is people learn the wrong lessons from these big events. The lessons weren't, hey, you can't have so much regulation and taxes so high that you throttle any type of entrepreneurial growth or any type of uh, incentive to invest. That's the proper lesson. But people, especially on the right, took the wrong lesson, which is 
Every tax cut is good. Every tax cut pays for itself. Every tax cut generates growth and jobs and wealth. And if that's the case, we'll just take it to extreme. Let's get rid of all our taxes. If every tax cut is good, that's the ultimate tax cut. And obviously, if taxes, if you raise taxes to 100 percent, why the hell am I going to go to work? If you're going to take all my money, I might as well sit and watch Netflix till they cut it off. Uh, the flip side of it is if taxes are zero, how are government ever? Well, run hold anything? on a second, though. Let's just be clear with with how it works. If you can raise taxes 100 percent, that's only 100 percent on your uh, on ta- on the money that you make over a certain level. You're even if even if taxes are 100- no, I'm saying I'm using the extreme tax. Everybody's every last penny. <laughs> okay. Why would anyone okay. go to work? OK, don't tax anybody at all. How is the government going to operate? Right. So what we want to look for is not more of this or more of that. We want to find the optimum level. And so over the past Let's call it 30 to 40 years. Um, the who pays the tax burden for running society, <laughs> meaning national defense and um, taking care of the roads and the highways and the tun- tunnels and bridges and schools, you know, airports, school, go down the list. Who The people who were paying that sort of got rejiggered. It used to be a big chunk was paid by corporation. They now pay the lowest amount they've ever paid in the past, I don't know, 90 years, maybe longer. And then the wealthy paid a disproportionate chunk. You know, why did Willie Sutton rob banks? That's where the money was. Why Why did the wealthy pay most of the taxes? That's where the money was. And, you know, people forget when we talk about wealth tax, when we talk about all these interesting um, taxes, uh, right now, we treat the wealthy and the uber wealthy and the insanely wealthy as if they're all one group. Right. So this is the observation that I made right. in this discussion. Right. So I depending on which data point you use, this was a footnote, but it's interesting. If you want to be in the top one percent. It's anywhere from two hundred seventy five to six hundred thousand dollars in America. Are you the top one percent of all Americans uh, are you the top 1% of taxpayers? Or are you the top 1% of income earners? Right? And those are three distinct groups, believe it or not. I yep. think it's but Americans. that's important to mention, yeah. Uh, uh, workers and then taxpayers are, are actually smaller. I'm, I'm sorry. There are fewer workers than there are taxpayers. So, so but let, let's use a round number like four hundred dollars or $500,000. So, if you make... You know, if you're in the top bracket, you're making like a buck 50 a year and you're you're paying the same tax rate as Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, probably less because of they're not even getting an income anymore. It's mm-hmm. all capital gains. And so that doesn't seem to make, you know, as Warren Buffett famously said, how is my secretary pay more percentage of her income than I do in taxes? It doesn't make any sense. So so we have these well, because he's a job creator and she's not. <laughs> Well, that's one way to look at it. So when you look at capital gains taxes, and I'm going to round this up so it's not stupid numbers. If you make less than $50,000 a year, essentially 44 and change, and you have a capital gain, you sell, make a couple of bucks on a house sale or a car sale or a stock sale, your capital gains tax is zero. You usually don't if you're making that that little money. You, you right, point to that's that. right. Well, you, not it's not you usually might. you have no legal obligation to pay capital gains so long as your gross adjusted income is forty four thousand, whatever mm-hmm. the number is, forty four two fifty. If you're single, and then it's somewhat more if you're married, eighty something if you're married. But all right, so let's say you're making between that forty four thousand number and four hundred and twenty five thousand. Well, you're going to pay fifteen percent. So you buy a, a, on long term capital gain. You buy a house for a hundred. You sell it for one hundred and fifty. You're going to pay seventy five hundred. Uh, that's fifteen percent of that fifty thousand um, dollars. And if you're making over four twenty five as a single um, taxpayer, you're going to pay twenty percent. Now here's where things get crazy, right? So ninety nine percent of the population is making less than. That four hundred and twenty five thousand that that's a pretty that's most of the country yeah. from people making no money, <clears throat> kids, retirees, unemployed to people making a nice living. Four hundred thousand in the United States is still a nice living. But now when you look at the top one percent, it's not a half a million dollar range. There are people in the top one percent, you know, the bottom of the top one percent are making half a million dollars. Some are making five million dollars. Some are making Fifty million dollars. Some are making 
$500 million. Some are making $5 billion. And a handful of people um, are making 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 billion dollars. You look at, you know, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, you know, those two guys had, they had a good year in 2020. So, so you have a $400 million range and then you have a $50 billion range. It's, it's just crazy. So why are we take taxing the, taxing the people who are making 400,001 the same as the people who are making 40 billion? It doesn't make any sense. So when I'm looking at these Biden proposals, and by the way, I wrote that before I knew the, anything that was in the speech. And it turned out I, I got a lot of it right. I, I, I mm. my takeaway was we are going to create its own the one percent where they're going to have their own class. The one percent are not like the rest of us. How is that possible? When whenever we do these surveys about income inequality and wealth inequality and we ask people how bad is income inequality? What do you think it should be and what's the worst case scenario? And you get their numbers based on how much, who owns how much and who mm-hmm. makes how much. Whatever their worst case scenario it is, it's never as unequal as it is in real life. It's worse than all these surveys and all these things that people think. So um, I think the Biden administration and, and the joke is all this stuff was public. Well, he put this in his, you know, his policy and his campaign platform in 2019. <laughs> Basically said it's time for the wealthiest Americans, says Joe Biden, the the candidate, to carry their fair share of the tax burden. That includes the top 1%. That includes corporate America. That includes everybody. And so what's going on is a giant rejiggering of how the tax burden is carried. So here are some numbers, and this is kind of insane. And, And my beat is the stock market, but there are elements of this that are parallel in real estate and elsewhere. Before you say this, though. Because rejiggering has not occurred yet. It's not been made law yet. This it's proposed. Is, this, this is just is a proposal. Just a proposal. Go ahead. And assuming Joe Manchin doesn't right, tap out, right, right. That's that'll determine uh, what ends up happening. Right. So, so it's, which is so crazy. It's can that's we just, what fifty fifty does. That's yeah, what, I know. You but know, but the, the, the idea of slave oh, trade compromise. This goes back. To seventeen, yeah, the electoral col- or rather the right. How, the, how, do we, how do we Senate. not just do this on population? I, we need to give small states. Yeah, but put that know, aside. Two, put that aside for a second. Fuck that guy, and and just the, the message. I mean, like West Virginia is where he's from, and every other state. I don't care if you're the a right wing conservative. If you are a business owner of any kind, you should overwhelmingly improve uh, approve of this giant infrastructure package oh, every uh, uh, who's losing like i usually think there are winners and losers in in almost every policy but in this policy it seems like everybody's winning unless you're concerned about the deficit and and nobody really is not really affecting anybody's lumber store or small right. business or whatever this is great this is great because you're getting a government contract and everybody else is getting money to buy whatever you're selling that's why it is overwhelmingly Approved, and then as you always make this point, everybody sees the demand. You see the demand for infrastructure improvements and 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 revitalization. So this is overwhelmingly positive. What is being done? Are you hearing anything from your wealthy friends and finance or anywhere else that says that they don't like this idea? That they think this is too much? That it's going to supercharge the economy? I heard uh, what's his name uh, t- saying he was concerned about it today, who I sometimes take seriously and I'm forgetting. But, by the way, there's been a lot of studies that show what happens when we raise or decrease the capital gains tax and it doesn't impact investment well, or the economy because it, in- it impacts individuals pockets. So the wealthy are going to be a touch less wealthy when they go to sell. But so let me just circle this back to equity because it's shocking. People are always stunned when I give them this number. The top 1% own a little more than half of all the stocks in America. <laughs> That's a pretty How substantial many number. That? Um it, it, How many investors? 1% 1% by just numbers Right in a country with 330 million. Well, how many people? people how many people are actually million. invested in stocks? But this is much less than that. How many people are invested in stocks? Very small percentage of Americans are actually um, invested. Well, half half the country has no stocks whatsoever. Right. Half so the it's population. Like, yeah. But here's the re- here's just to show you how this falls on the middle class. The top one percent owns more than fifty percent. The next nine percent. So to flesh out the rest of the top. 
10%. That group owns a little more than 33%. You put them together and you're talking about the top 10% between 86 and 88% of all the stock, which means the entire middle class from the 50th percentile to the 90 percentile, they own 12% of the stocks. So the, by the way, these are people with decent middle class jobs, IRAs, 401ks, maybe some of them have stock options at their companies. That's 12% of the publicly traded stock. Now, like my company, like your company, there are private stockholders, and then there's real estate and there's other stuff. And, and some of these are not quite as outrageously disproportionate because, I mean, other than a handful of people buying those $100 million penthouses, really, you know, houses, there's only so much money you can spend on that because there's so much land. And so you got to put 100 million families in a bunch of places to live. But even then, you're going to see some disproportionate, not nearly as as much as equities. So the takeaway is, over the past 30 years, the 1% have done really well. They've seen uh, captured, when you look at how income and wealth has gone up, they're capturing more and more of the pie. The middle class is, if it's lucky, it's going sideways and everybody else is going down. And on top of that, because the tax burden nationally has dropped, it's falling on the middle class and, and, and the poor to deal with it. Crappy mass transit, mm. shitty highways and roads, third world airports, um, you know, electrical grids. Hey, listen, you know, Texas made some really dumb uh. decisions, but hold that aside. How uh, that is just a decision. We are not going to invest in our infrastructure. We are not going to um, harden our um whether it was wind or natural gas or anything, we're not going to weatherproof this because it's Texas. And how often does it, you know, freeze down here? Well, as we anybody who read the papers about that story, as it turned out, well, a decade ago, this happened yep. and they never bothered to yep. update it. So who is suffering for, you know, the gasoline tax that pays for the highway trust fund and bridges and tunnels and and highways? That's been locked at 18 cents a gallon since 1993. Mm -hmm. Like, I think everybody who gets a flat tire should put in the mail to fucking Grover Norquist's house I was just and say, hey, asshole, I was just this about is to your say, fault. You owe me 500 bucks. I was. That's really funny. I was just right? about Imagine to say Imagine like that. hundreds of broken axles, <laughs> thousands of tires just just showing up at his metal. house. Like the whole picture of suburban neighborhood um, on like the Simpsons with the family guy and just a junkyard of damaged vehicle parts. <laughs> that's what should happen to that stupid ideological person who has made everybody in America's yep. life harsher, uglier, Brother worse. Norquist has Thanks made, for fucking all of us. And almost no Republican at the state or a federal level has uh, not signed the pledge that he has had out for over 20 years, I think, to not right. raise taxes. No, Someone should dox, that, dox him and, and well, have I people send their junk car parts to his I'm house. Not sure. I don't mean damage him. Maybe I mean, his P.O. Box. Just send your flat tires to <laughs> That's him. That's really good. Yeah, no, he's, uh, he has done you more damage. You can see I'm on the fence on this. <laughs> he's done more damage than almost has, any other I mean, single it's, person. Listen, it's not just him. It's everybody who Dick has Cheney. convinced a chunk of the public that... Government is the enemy. Yes, and, yes. You know, the public library is socialism and yep. putting money into roads is, you know, communism and teaching just, is easy. <laughs> now, by the way, I, I want to point out that the Democrats have done a really crappy job explaining to people what Michael Lewis has done in these last two books, that government is an essential service. They are your sheriff of last resort. They're the ones that keep you safe against the Nazis. I don't against, know. I don't, they cured I, I, polio. Go down the, the list. I don't is know endless. if I agree with that as much as they, they're not playing the same game as Republicans. It's very hard to combat the theories that uh, and the propaganda that conservative Republicans have been putting out for the last 30 years about the role of government. It's so hard because every all they do is use anecdotes, the exception of the rule. And, and, and it's so powerful that it's hard. It's hard to, need to be said for that. It's the, hard to that, combat the welfare fair. queen myth. That's so that did so much damage and there's so many others like that and right. you know, i've been thinking about this a lot lately well mcdonald's and walmart are my favorite uh, you do a welfare great job queens. to point yeah, yeah to, to point the, out those are the modern welfare yeah. queens um someone does this fantastic 
did this fantastic, I'm trying to remember where I read this, where they're telling the story about, oh, uh, it's Bill Bernstein in Del- the, the Delusions of Crowd, that, that book, where they're telling a story about uh, the debate between Donald Trump and Ben Carson, and he's talking about, this is pre-2016, talking about vaccines and this yeah. and that, and Carson gives like a legitimate scientific answer. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you know, there are very, very few side effects. There are a few, you know, dozen per millions of people. Look at how many lives the measles vaccine and mm-hmm. smallpox and polio. Think about what a disaster this was before we had vaccines. And then Trump says, a woman in my office, beautiful daughter, beautiful young girl, Autism caused by a, yeah. a flu vaccine, and it was all bullshit. It was t- first of all, he made up the story, but hold yeah. that aside. The emotionally compelling story very often is effective against dry data and facts. Yes. And so yes. you need a compelling story to say, well, that's interesting. And then tell the story about the family that was crippled by polio and how many people did, you know, one mother buried 12 kids to Mm -hmm. smallpox. And that's what the wife was like. You want to go back to that? Is that what you want to do? Do you want mothers burying 12 dead children? But the better stupid, but the better example over (laughs) the better example in the most pernicious, you know, one I think done the most damage is that. Government handouts, that government assistance for especially people on the, uh, you know, well, living you know, in a poverty. Of, a lot of poor white people have creates, benefited from that, and that story doesn't get told. Uh, no, it doesn't get told enough, but it, that it creates dependency on government. That is a powerful, powerful message that has been really effective. Um, right. So, so, so that's listen, there be, are people, I don't know what your religious beliefs are, but none, there are people none. who help crafted these very... Um, damaging yep. tools, and the good news is that if there is a God, these people will burn in hell for eternity. Ha! That what? just doesn't bring me any solace. Today. No, me neither, because I don't buy it. But uh, all right, I gotta let you go. But finally, um, did you see the the speech last night? What did you think of Joe Biden's speech? And what do you think of? I did not see the speech last uh, what night. What were you doing? I was prepping this presentation oh, for right. today, so mm-hmm. I was working late into. The, I was burning mm-hmm. the midnight oh, candle. Look at you. Hmm. So that's why I look, I look like I could use a cup of coffee and a shower. And, uh, and tonight I'm just going to kick back tonight and just chill out. I'm will you check up on that. me tomorrow, seeing as that I got my second shot today? Will you um, care about me at Oh, all? congratulations. Yeah. That's fat. So we went out to dinner last night. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, my wife still hasn't gotten home, so we can go another 10 minutes oh, or okay. till I hear her walk in. Um, or until the dogs hear her walk in, because I'm going to, uh, they'll let me know before I hear it. Um so I'm now I'm now on my second, third week, fourth week. I don't, I, Since your oh, second shot. Yeah. So so we went out to dinner like, like yesterday was beautiful. It was 72 and sunny. Yeah, nice. And I said to my wife, hey, let, let's go to Basil Leaf. They got a nice outdoor space and the food is usually good. So she's like, make reservations. So we went there and it was it was jam. We got got six or seven thirty. I'm like, dude, on a Wednesday. He's like, it's nice out. People want to sit outside. So. We went outside, filled with people. Inside, they had the plexiglass. We're sitting out in the patio. And it's like, so I took a photo of what I was eating and tweeted it and said, get vaccinated and then go out to dinner and enjoy and relax. You don't have to worry that you're going to get sick. Yeah. So it's um, a wonderful feeling. It, it it it's a weight, you know, you know, the worst the worst case scenario is maybe you'll get a flu, but it's not going to kill you. And hopefully you're not going to spread it around to other people. That's like a huge relief off of. uh, So Monday, I'm going back into the office. I don't mean every day, but just a one off. Well, well, our open office has been open for a year. Essentially, we um, we have a bunch of employees who live in and around Midtown and we're stuck in their little apartments. And so we reopened the office and said, hey, as long as you guys are socially distant, open windows, you know, bask when you're together. You So there's always been the past year, there's been two, three, four people in the office hmm. at any given day, um, as opposed to 20 people. Uh, but, you know, if you if you live walking distance and you're in a studio, let me get the hell out of my office, out of my house for a couple yeah. of hours. Uh, so, so we've been doing that. 
Um, I don't know if everything is like 100% back to normal until the fall, assuming the these mutations and variants don't get worse and worse. I mean, what's going on in India today is just astonishing. It's really bad. And um, I'm going to share something with you. It's called oxygenforindia.org. You can help these uh, help the country actually purchase oxygen for use by patients because mm. they've run out of oxygen. They've run out of money. It's it's a horror show. Um, they're looking at like three hundred, four hundred thousand new infections a day. That was like, man, I, I think our peak was two hundred thousand. It's such an interesting issue to think about if you don't care about anybody in, in your neighborhood, your community or your country and you only care about yourself, then you still want people in India to get vaccinated because borders yeah, don't, ch- don't change us. It's a, it's a, I mean, if you literally, if you only care about yourself, you want other people uh, to get vaccinated, to have worn masks and, and, and so on. And so and in the United States, because look, you know, the pro- if there were no mutations and then there were no variants, you could say, hey, you'll get to herd immunity depending yeah. on which expert yeah. you listen to. 62%, 66%, but something like that. But since there are variants and mutations, and, and the, by the way, the double mutation in India is horrific because it's more communicable and more deadly. Mm. I mean, talk about pff, snake eyes coming up. It's awful. Um, so because there are mutations, you now, again, depending which expert you want to listen to, you want to get to 75% or 80%. And there are some people are, are like, you really look, the, the vaccine is only 95% effective. That means one out of 20 people who take the vaccine and are exposed to COVID will contract it. And the good news is they won't get a bad case. They're probably not going to be a long hauler, although we still don't have enough details and data and the, and they're not going to die. So that's why you take it. But it doesn't mean it ki- stops it dead. It means it takes it from DEFCON 5 down to, right. you know, something much, much less than that. So what is that are. Oxygen for India thing? I want to make sure I include that in the uh, Oxygen for India dot org. All right. All right well, yeah. I got to go pick up my daughter anyway. So. So here we are. That's fantastic. Thank I got to go feed the, the kids. I got to go feed the dogs right now. Thank you now. very much for talking to me as always. I appreciate I, it. Great way to Again, I'm going to tell you, this is just me jabbering and I don't know who gives a crap about any of this. Stop it. Everybody. I'm just, no, I'm it. not, this is not, you know me. I, I, I don't have imposter syndrome and I don't have false humility. I don't have any of that no, crap. No, no, I don't think it is. It's just as me free. I'm, I'm pretty like I'm, this is the end of a two week exhausting run. And like, I'm now on fumes. I'm I just didn't notice. I'm coasting downhill into the finish line and uh, I'm like ready to just, you know, well, <laughs> enjoy it. You look and sound as great as always. I thank you for joining me, sir. My and enjoy pleasure, Keith. the, so the downtime. I hope and we the made tax bullshit more interesting and, and won- less wonky. And I don't know if I fully explained it. We just kept going on. Well, go, on go read it. Everybody should go read it. You've got a whole long piece about I'll, it. Long, yeah, it's, so. it's, it's wonky, but good, as we say. Uh, yeah, we might not get to the end of it, but still, it's uh, All right, you good. have to go read it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, man. All right, there he goes, at Ritholtz, at Ritholtz. And check out the Big Picture blog, subscribe to his reads, listen to his podcast, Masters in Business, read him at Bloomberg. And how many more plugs can I give the guy? Get his book, Bailout Nation, which is still important and relevant and very well researched and always a pleasure when he joins me. A good duo, Ritholtz and Finnegan. We should try to do that more often on Fridays. What do you think of that idea? Thank you very much for listening this week, everybody. Sincerely, it's, uh, I cannot do it without your support. You've got I've got ads on the show now, but I can't do it without your subscription. So if you haven't already signed up for a paid subscription, it'd be amazing if you did. It'd make my weekend to see new subscriptions come in. I always appreciate them. It's only $5 uh, or more. You can subscribe uh, for any number. You can raise your subscription if you're paying 5 bucks uh, to something higher as well. Edit your pledge upward at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. I'm so glad to have you in my life and listening in this listening community. So many great, amazing, thoughtful, generous, kind, hilarious folks. I love you. Can't do it without you. 
And I will talk to you on Monday right here on Stand Up. And now, one of uh, our favorite members of our community, he is a Grammy Award winning singer and songwriter, and he wrote this song just for us. John Carroll, take it away with Stand Up. Oh, your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. She's the face where every lost child will finally be found. There's only one thing to do before we stand our ground, and that's Stand Up. For a crystal ball Drawing all the plans of the But all they had to go on Was the time they were in With other causes for laws And since they weren't even sent They knew that change was gonna come Before the change could begin They had to stand up All right, they had to stand up We got to stand up We got to look the devil square in the eye See him flee the seat of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton try Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up